I try to do accents sometimes, and they uh-huh. always like devolve into they something always devolve else. In the same I always right. go to Russian. Russian. That's what you end up slipping <laughs> into. Give it to us. Well, like our Russian, like I just, it's just like loogie in my mouth. <laughs> Russian, right? Like, and then the Australian or yeah. Australian, Eastenders. Sorry, like, Good day, mate. Good day, mate. Good on you. That's all I got. Though. Shrimp like, on the Barbie. That's <laughs> 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 about it. A bunch of our students in ministry, they went to Hillsong um, yeah. for college. And so yeah. they would always come back like, yeah, mate. Yeah, mate. Like, You're not Australian. Stop <laughs> it. Yeah. Our goal on this podcast is to know Jesus better and by the power of his spirit do better. So together we can be a little better. Well, welcome to A Little Better. So glad to have you here for week two of our summer series, Storyteller. Storyteller, we are diving deep into the parables of Jesus. We have a number of speakers who are all talking about parables that, Matt, you chose this parable, right? It means means something to you, I think. I know I chose mine, Callum chose. I mean, I'm just loving, you know, the passion that people bring, Mm. you know, to these parables. So, Um, Matt Soans brought us the message this week. Uh, Drew and I are here to uh, bask in your erudition. (laughs) I don't even know what that means. I've never heard that word before either, but I'm ready to bask in your erudition. I probably mispronounce it, E-R-U-D-I-T-I-O-N. But anyway, uh, Matt, as we always do, why don't you kick us off giving us your sermon in 60. Yeah, Jesus tells these pretty intense parables, uh, basically saying, hey, the cost of following me, of being my apprentice, is really high. Mm. Um, And so we explore a little bit what does it mean to be a disciple? Uh, That's really like being an apprentice of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then what does it mean to count the cost? And and there's really two costs, the cost of being a disciple and the cost of not being a disciple. Mm. Wow, you got right to it. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's unpack that a little bit because uh, you spent uh, 25 minutes or so with us on Sunday, but uh, usually there's more left unsaid. We, we always have to make these cuts, right? We always have to find a way to just hone in on the essential parts, but there's usually something we're still passionate about. Were there other things you left on the table, yeah, things sure. you wanted to talk about? I mean, so there's like... I get a little soapboxy about this, and so I had to cut it, and it was just painful that I couldn't get to say this out loud to everybody. Uh, so here I go. I'm saying it now. But we talk about disciple. We we use the word disciple uh, in, in modern Christianity as if it were a verb. Mm-hmm. Like, this is something that somebody can do to someone else. Like, mm-hmm. Pastor, will you disciple me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a verb. <laughs> so like, stop using it as a verb, guys. Um, like, I... I'm all for people meeting one-on-one and helping each other become better disciples. Yeah. Um, but when we use it that way, as if it's something someone can do to me, then my relationship with Jesus, my formation, my maturity becomes someone else's responsibility, mm-hmm. right? And disciple isn't a verb. It's not somebody else's job to do it to me. Mm-hmm. I have to choose to be a disciple or not be a disciple. It's a noun. You feel better now? I feel so much better. <laughs> got that out. So glad you joined us. Matt, some, his blood pressure has come down. He got that off his chest. Yeah, I, I'm certainly guilty of that, you know, thinking of discipleship, you know, you know, which really is, you know, m- making the word itself disciple, to disciple someone, a verb. And I think to us, when we think of it as a verb, we probably define it pretty narrowly too, mm. right? It's just like, oh, I'm getting disciple, which means I meet with someone and we go through, we read a book or we study sure. this or whatever. And it's something- All good things. Yeah, all good things, but they're isolated little events in our lives rather than the whole way we live our lives. Mm. So um, I wanted to, <clears throat> I was just kind of curious. I wanted to back up. We started talking about it last week too, but um, just the whole idea of parables and um, what is, um, what do you love about parables? What's so cool about parables? How are they different? Um, you know, then I think, am I right? I'm trying to think. Are parables only in the Gospels or do we find them? Oh, I guess we do find a few other occasions of parables. 
And now I'm rambling here, but I'm thinking <laughs> of, you know, obviously uh, the prophet Nathan talking to David. There was a parable he told to I mean, get David's I, attention. I, I think when it comes to parables, I think that's what really <clears throat> set Jesus apart in his teaching, mm-hmm. right? When you think about the way they taught in the synagogues before Jesus, it was much of a reading of a scroll and then like talking about the scroll. But mm-hmm. usually... I, it, it doesn't seem in, throughout history there was a lot of like using a story that related to my life or was mm-hmm. so easily understandable to make a point. And I think, you know, even you talked about this, this is for, you know, you stopped, right? Like, hey, I'm going to stop after the first couple of words, right? Large crowds came after Jesus because they could understand mm-hmm. what he was asking of them, even if it was hard, at least they had clarity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what parables do is they make it real life and bring clarity oftentimes to the point he's trying to make. Mm -hmm. And the name of our series is Storyteller. Just think of the power of story, Mm -hmm. you know, and we know it. I mean, it's just always true, right? Like I'm just trying to think of modern analogs, but you know, the movies were very image driven and we just get drawn into stories are so powerful Mm. because you know they make sense of the world and then they suggest a point and a purpose you know know, when there's true there's an emotional connection that we have with a story that we don't get if it's just a lesson right right Uh, that i so much of what we know is is kind of implicitly inside of us Mm -hmm. not like explicitly in our head Right. Um, and, and stories allow us to connect emotionally with that truth in an implicit way with, with what's inside of us and expose that and help us wrestle with it's it. It's like the balance of like the lesson is the intellectual head knowledge. Yep. The story is connecting that intellect with the emotions that you feel. And those two together help us walk a certain way. That's right. And it's a great linkage to life, right? Because you think about like education, you know, just these propositions or teaching. It's very dry, very sterile. But here's a story. And what's a story? A story is an experience, right? Mm -hmm. And then it connects to our lived experience. And that's really what you talked about is the experience of being a disciple and how encompassing uh, that is. Um, So... I'm wondering if I'm upsetting you by um, going <laughs> to be because you said I mean here you guys have your soapbox that which is accurate and true that disciple is a noun and you gave us some historical background on what that meant in Jesus' day. Sure. So what it meant in Jesus' day was these were people only a few were picked and then they got to live with sure. their what rabbi mentor rabbi. to yeah. you know and and really Jesus twists up the typical rabbi kind of paradigm in a couple of interesting ways um he uh, a typical rabbi only the best and brightest could apply to follow a rabbi here's Jesus going around inviting people right to Commoners. He's, he's like yeah. calling yeah uh, you know um which is just a crazy like you it makes it a more understandable why a guy would like suddenly drop his nets and like jump out of the boat and go follow this guy. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you got the, like the, the smartest of the smart, the highest of the high saying like, Hey, come with me. You can do this thing. It was like, I didn't even make it past elementary school. Right. And I get to now go to this graduate class. Right. Right. So where I was going with that is what, is there a way that is or should be lived today in terms of relationships? I mean, we talked about following mm-hmm. Jesus, but are there ways that we follow or influence each other? Are there helpful ways, you know, you know, you know, to do that? And has that been true? Have you experienced that, you know, in your life? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, I, we are relational people, right? Mm-hmm. God made us in a relational way. He is relational. He's triune. And so, um, that's part of who we are and God designed us for community. Community is one of the things that we practice in, mm-hmm. in Jesus way. Like he, he created community around himself. And so that's, it is really important. We change in relationship, mm-hmm. right? That's how we change. Mm-hmm. You don't, nobody changes in isolation. Right. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. The relationship is critical. Right. 
and Drew, you I know you've spoken in the past about mentors in your own life, people sure. who have shaped you and influenced you. Um, how, how, how has that worked for you and what would you encourage other people to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what's hard about like just the culture of the Bible and the culture today. So different, right? Anybody know any rabbis? <laughs> right? One. <laughs> yeah, one, exactly. <laughs> the same one you're talking about, right? Yeah. So um, it's just a different culture. But like in our culture today, I think, man, we have people in our lives, like Paul even said in the word, like follow me as I follow Christ. Mm -hmm. So like I think at, at some level, what's different though is like we're not trying to become the rabbi anymore, right? In, in that culture, right, a rabbi would basically develop you to be a rabbi, in, in the, the culture that Jesus is building, he's always the rabbi. We're just now living out his ways and walking with him. And you can do that in multiple ways, through people's influence, through you know, all the practices or that you talked about today mm -hmm. or in your sermon. And so, um, yeah, I mean, so many, so many things influence what type of disciple I am. But mm -hmm. I do like the, the version of like, I'm either a disciple or not. Yeah. One question I had, like I thought about when I was listening to your message is like someone's listening and they're like, they're evaluating. You're right. You're, you're asking them to basically say, Hey, are you part of the crowd or are you, are you a disciple? What if someone's like, huh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that person? How do I, how do I evaluate? How do I know if I'm a disciple or not? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know, that's I, why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> Drew loves being in that chair. Oh, I do. It's there. wonderful. <laughs> hey, you want to answer that? Let me throw some haymakers this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, part of it is, um, you know, you can evaluate yourself uh, based on your love for Jesus. Like, mm. do you love Jesus? Um, do you desire to obey him? We're not going to be able to do it all the time. Yeah. Uh, but like part of it for me is like when I am experiencing sin in my life, am I struggling with sin yeah. or am I just accepting it, yep. happy with it, giving into it? Yep. Um, the struggle says I'm trying to follow Jesus, yep. right? And so that's, that's like an easy indicator for me. Um, when mm -hmm. I'm starting to just get used to my sin, and mm. be happy with it, um, then that's an indicator like, whoa, I'm, I'm not really following Jesus' way yep. here. I'm not trying to walk the right way. And I think that's true to like, look at Jesus' disciples. Talk <laughs> about this. You're not talking about a perfect bunch of guys who always oh. got it right. You're talking about guys who struggled through it, but they could see the struggle and wanted to grow through the struggle, mm. right? And I think that is one of the big indicators of are you a truly disciple? Like when you choose sin, are you like, oh, uh, cool, I like that. Or are you like almost heartbroken? Like how could I engage with that? And God, I don't want to do that anymore. Help change me. Right. Yeah, boy, this, the disciples are a story of failure after failure, yeah. misunderstanding after misunderstanding. There was a long process, you know, mm -hmm. before they really got what Jesus was modeling and trying to communicate. And I think uh, when we talk about, and Jeremy did a great job talking about this last week, but when, when we talk about something like practicing the way of Jesus, yep. like d it, it can feel very moralistic. Like there's just a bunch of stuff we have to do to be able to be with Jesus a point and be like him. Yeah. And it's not that. And it's, it's really the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It's him getting yep. himself into us. Um, it's not about a bunch of stuff we do, but we do have a responsibility to do it. Do it. <laughs> yeah. And so there's this, there's this paradox, this tension there yeah. that is, uh, it, and I think it comes down to where our heart is. Like, am I trying to earn something? Right. Or am I just putting in the effort to be with the one I love? I think that's why I loved you before you ever got to practices, you started with presence. Mm -hmm. So presence is relationship, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's wanting to be with Jesus, knowing Jesus is the reward, right? And then you go to purpose, right? Those two things are the starting place, right? And mm -hmm. then out of that, the presence of God and the purpose he gives you, it's not, I have to do these things. It's like, man, I get to be a part right. of these things, right? Mm -hmm. And I think for so many Christians today, we, we skip past presence. <laughs> we kind of got some purpose, 
but it's just like, I got to do all these things, right? It's this list of yeah. rules and God doesn't love me if I don't do them right. And it's, you're miss, you missed two yeah. really important ingredients in this journey of like, you get to be with God. You get to walk with God in this life. His presence actually lives in you. Yeah. So I always find it helpful to compare spiritual life with physical life. And we just know that God made our bodies a certain way. And there's certain things if we do, you know, I mean, there's ways we'll eat where our bodies will flourish, ways we'll eat that our bodies will mm-hmm. really suffer. There's exercise, there's sleep habits, there's all kinds of things that we know uh, promote, you know, mm-hmm. physical health. And it would just be foolish, you know, not to cooperate with that, right? You know, God designed our bodies. This is the way they flourish. This is what we got to do. And spiritually, you're, the practices that you laid out are the kinds of things like as we do these things, that's that our spirits flourish. You know, yeah. this is the life God wants us to grow. And when you get to the end of it, you know, the co- we can the cost of foolish choices with our physical health, you know, we pay that price, right? right. Yeah. And I you do, had that cost of a cost of foolish, pre, foolish. I do think you practices. have to be careful though, because okay. you can do all the practices mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and almost fool yourself into the benefit. If you miss yeah, the presence, you know, mm-hmm. with physical things, if I go work out and I eat healthy, it's going to lead to that place. Right. But you see this warning through the people who Jesus is addressing oftentimes in his parables right. of the people who are doing all the practices. Oh, yeah, true. And they miss out yeah. on the presence. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it's just a good reminder for people is you can go through all the right motions, you can do all the right things, but you got to remember, without Jesus, it's pointless. Right. It's meaningless. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned one of those practices being Sabbath, and Jesus said, God, you know, made, you know, the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. Mm, It's, you know, the practice is supposed to serve you. You're not supposed to be a slave to it. Yeah. But uh, I know you had mentioned, we were talking before the camera started rolling about... um, what practices look like in our lives. So you, you made this presentation and kind of flew, right? Just listed, yeah. you know, <laughs> mentioned, you know, yeah. the practices. And I think you had suggested, you know, maybe we could talk about what do those practices look like in our lives? What have we yeah. found that, you know, you know, thrives? I don't know who wants to go first on that. Be my guest. Sure. <laughs> um, I, uh, one of the one of the things that has re- been a significant rhythm for our family for the last three years is Sabbath, mm. um, and taking a day to stop and rest and just delight in God, uh, mm. be together to not work. Um, it uh, it's one of those things that you know. As Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. It's I think it's the only one that we feel like we don't have to obey anymore. Um, mm-hmm. you know, like, why is that? Mm-hmm. But um, for for us, like going into it, I was like, we got way too much stuff to do. Like, uh-huh. I d- I don't know how we're going to not do anything for a day and like still get it all done. And so it really was a step of faith for us to say like, yeah. okay, we're going to do this, and somehow the things still get done. Yeah. Um, and we, and it's, it's really been a helpful rhythm for us. As a Can family. I ask what day is that on a Sunday? Is it a different day of the week? What is your Sabbath um, day? Well, I, I've transitioned jobs within that time that we started. So originally mm-hmm. we were doing it Saturday to Sunday. Um, then after I started working at church, Sunday is kind of a work day. So that wasn't working mm-hmm. for us anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we switched to kind of Friday night to Saturday night. Okay. And then more recently we just switched to doing the whole, whole day Friday. Mm -hmm. Um, So wake up on Friday. We don't do any work until we wake up again on Saturday. Um, That's been really cool for us. Before when we like would start Friday evening, there was this like time of rushing to prepare right before dinner on Friday. Like we got to get everything done before we stop. And that just made the beginning of our Sabbath like hectic um, and not a feeling of stopping and relaxing. So (laughs) Yeah, I, I I think we talk about these practices you, like scripture and prayer. I think seem fairly obvious, you know, to For all sure. of us. But some of these others, maybe we're like, huh, Sabbath, solitude, uh, yeah. some of these other things. Um, Drew, any practices that you just felt have 
strengthened your soul or yeah i i think um getting to uh the uh uh some other ones i think the one that jesus speaks about a little bit in this passage is the practice of denying yourself oh yeah Mm -hmm. um saying no to things you want when you don't really need them for the benefit of something else right yeah um I'm I'm not the greatest at that, um, no. but like I I'm trying to in life, and this is something new that I'm just working with my family is like, hey, how can we deny ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. How can we? And I don't even know necessarily. Well, one way that I know my wife has started is she will fast. Um, so fasting is a great way to deny yourself something for the purpose of focusing on yep. Jesus or asking Jesus for something. Mm-hmm. And so I've done intermittent fasting in my life for my health and for like the practice of saying no to something that I want as a spiritual discipline. And so mm-hmm. um, I think denial, I think, is really a huge part of the cost That's of right. discipleship, right? Is like, n- no, right? Mm-hmm. I don't like to be told no. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a, such a s- huge spiritual discipline that is often missed. Yeah, and I, I it's, a, it's just like, we've got to work out our self-control muscles, mm. right? Yep. And mm-hmm. fasting, like choosing intentional pain, like I'm going to deny it, we're... <laughs> We, our culture says you shouldn't deny yourself anything, anything ever, yeah. right? And so to choose, I'm not going to eat, even mm-hmm. though my body wants it. Yep. It's just practicing self-control like that. And it, I think that can really help us when we struggle with indulgent sins, Yep. right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Whether it's gluttony that's directly food related or yep. it's sexual sins. Um, and the, uh, Go ahead. It, fasting can really help. Uh, when you're wrestling with that. And I think denial is so like a a huge part. Like half the reason why people don't read their Bibles is because they won't deny themselves something that they want, Mm -hmm. right? I won't deny myself Netflix or I won't deny myself sleep. So to get up earlier to be with God's presence. And I think behind a lot of the disciplines that we struggle with is this, I won't do what Jesus says is the cost, right? I won't deny myself this for that. But that's they, where that question, what, where is my way taking me? Yes. Is yep. so helpful to me. Yep. Mm-hmm. And convicting to me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's such a challenge. I mean, obviously, Jesus tells us to take up our cross daily, which obviously means to die daily. And it's just like, really? Every day? Is this isn't. An, and, but I, I, I have the same. I'm an Enneagram 7, which supposedly the motivation means avoidance of pain at all costs. Mm. So those denial disciplines of Mm. fasting or even uh, it's a real wrestle Mm. for me. And it makes me sad. It makes me sad because I say it just makes me realize like... I care more about food, you know, than time with God or feeding on Christ. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's just, it makes me sad that I am that captive, you know, to those indulgences. And silence is another one that's just to take the noise out of my life, to drive like in a silent car or just to have silent time. I don't have to fill my life with podcasts, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, audible books, you know, those things. A lot of us do that and that's profitable, right? But when your life is just all noise, it's very Mm -hmm. hard. I've, but again, those are challenging for me. They're not easy, and they yeah. often make me sad <laughs> before sure. they make me, you know, before I get to enjoy mm-hmm. the spirit. But uh, um, wow! Uh, so let's wrap it up this way. Which is, you mentioned a book. Yeah. Um, you mentioned an author, an author who's written multiple books. That's right. Um, and there are other books on this topic as well. What what additional resources are you super fond of? people would find helpful. Yeah. Um, I think if you're, if this topic is at all interesting to you, practicing the way by John Mark Comer is fantastic. And I think I might've mentioned this in the sermon, but, uh, is it y- safe to say that's the, if people are going to choose one book, that's a, that's the great choice. That's, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there are lots of great books on what people typically call spiritual disciplines. What yeah. are the practices mm-hmm. of Jesus? Yeah. Years ago, uh, Dallas Willard and Richard Foster were names that many of us were reading. It was funny because I remember Dallas Willard came to, um, it wasn't even chapel, it was just like a talk in the evening at uh, our seminary, and we're all like reading this book, and he talks about fasting, and we're like, what does that look, is he going to be real skinny? (laughs) 
<laughs> he showed up. Spoiler alert. He was not real skinny. <laughs> but I'm sure he was practicing <laughs> fasting. Wow. The but poor bus a- that just hit Dallas Willard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dallas. <laughs> About that. But uh, anyway, so listen, thanks, Matt, so much. Yeah. I mean, I felt like your sermon scratched the tip of the iceberg, and now I feel like this podcast has scratched the tip of the iceberg. Mm. So maybe that's good. I hope everyone is leaving hungry for more. Yeah. Hungry yeah. to understand. Understand, but also hungry to do. It's not. Mm. It's not over with the sermon. It's not over with the podcast. This is what we need to sink ourselves into. So these are great ways to go, and uh, I hope you keep coming back. We've got eight more parables to go. Uh, every one of them, incredible. We'll see you soon. <laughs>